Hello, my name is Melissa Elliott. I am a nurse education coordinator here at St. Joseph Mercy Oakland. I am the educator for 4G, our inpatient oncology unit, as well as the outpatient infusion center. As the oncology educator, one of my jobs is to ensure the competency of chemotherapy administration among the nurses. My background is working nine years as a bedside RN with the oncology patient population. And I have two certifications from the Oncology Nursing Society in Chemotherapy Administration. Today, we'll talk about patient and staff safety surrounding intravesical chemotherapy. The first thing we're going to look at are the pre-procedure considerations. When the urologist, resident, or provider call the OR scheduler and board a patient, we're asking that they board the patient with bladder installation. The OR scheduler has also been asked that when they receive a phone call from the urologist or the urology resident, that they ask if the patient is to be boarded with a bladder installation. Putting this on there alerts pharmacy so that they have ample time to prepare the medication. It also allows them to ensure that they have the appropriate staff working as not every staff member that works down there is able to prepare chemotherapy. Next, we need to ensure that the consent is signed by the patient and includes bladder installation of chemotherapy. Next, there is an additional chemotherapy consent form to be completed. This includes the diagnosis, the medication, and any potential side effects. This is considered to be best practice and is supported by our cancer committee regionally. We're going to look at the intra-op administration considerations, which include personal protective equipment, supplies, documentation, administration, the OR to PACU transfer, and spill management. The first thing we'll look at are PPE and our supplies. Having appropriate PPE is essential when administering chemotherapy to protect the healthcare worker. Our latex-free sterile gloves state on the packaging that they are non-permeable to chemotherapy. We should wear two pairs of these gloves when administering the chemotherapy and also a face shield as there is a potential for splashing. All PPE drapes, syringes that the medication come in should all be disposed of in the chemotherapy waste bin. They look like the images pictured here. These are available in the OR area. As far as documentation, two RNs are to verify the patient, medication, and the dose. The provider will be the one to administer the medication and because of this, when the RNs document in EPIC, as the provider is unable to document in the MAR in EPIC, the RNs need to do a dual sign-off. Chemotherapy requires a dual sign-off, and then they will comment medication administered by Dr. So-and-so. After the medication is documented on the MAR, we're able to see the administration time, and then the primary RN is to put in a communication order documenting the dwell time. Our dwell time is one hour, unless otherwise stated by the physician, and the communication order should state that the medication was administered at such time, and the dwell time is complete at whatever time is provided by the physician. The administration of intravesical chemotherapy should take place in three settings. The first and standard administration setting is intraoperatively. This is when the chemotherapy is delivered prior to or during the procedure and can be administered while the patient is still in the OR. If the chemotherapy is not ready for intraop administration, it is okay to be administered in the PACU setting. However, the physician or provider is to be the one to administer the medication in the PACU. The only other setting outside of intraoperatively or in the PACU is if the patient 
is unable to receive it in these areas, and in which case the patient will be transferred to 4G and the provider will come to the bedside and administer the medication there. They will need to coordinate with the 4G RN as to when the medication is to be administered so that they have time to set everything up. The patient will still need the procedure consent, the chemotherapy consent form, and there will also be a universal timeout to be completed. When the patient moves from the OR to the PACU, we want to ensure a safe transfer. The patient should have a disposable plastic-backed absorbent pad, or a blue pad, placed under the Foley, but over their groin area during administration and while moved into the PACU. This is because if there's any chemotherapy that leaks, we're able to have it go onto the absorbent pad rather than onto the patient's skin. And the absorbent pad can be easily disposed of in our chemotherapy waste bin. The patient is also to have a clamp placed on the catheter itself to prevent leaking of the chemotherapy from the catheter into the Foley drainage bag. The catheter is to be attached to a urinary drainage bag for safety purposes. In the event that the clamp comes disconnected and the chemotherapy drains out, we want it to have a safe place to drain into, and that would be a urinary drainage bag. Here we have pictured what the RNs will place on the chemotherapy, on the, I'm sorry, on the Foley bag. We're asking them to place these chemotherapy caution stickers in three different places near the catheter itself, at the end of the tubing, and then on the back. These stickers are available in the OR area. And this is so that if anybody comes up to the Foley and is going to empty it, they're aware that there is potentially chemotherapy in this bag. The next thing we're going to look at is spill management. In the event that a spill is to happen, there are spill kits available in each area where chemotherapy is being administered or maintained. In the OR area, in the PACU, and on 4G. Here we have pictured, um, these are wipes. They're, one moment please. Excuse me. These wipes are called surface safe. There's step one and step two. This is part of our chemo kit, our spill kit. And I am going to skip to the next slide to show you what's all in the kit. So our chemotherapy spill kits include a sharps container, anti-fog goggles, HD spill warning tent, a chemo apron with sleeves, the isolator plus N95 mask, surface safe kit, which are the wipes I just showed you. These wipes are labeled one and two. The first one labeled number one is a high potency bleach. The second one labeled number two is an inactivating agent. The next thing is a chemotherapy waste bag to dispose of everything in, a bouffant cap, anti-skid shoe covers, chemo disposable slider bag, green Z pouches, a bio scoop and scraper, Zorb sheets, and chemo plus neoprene gloves. I will now click on this video and talk you through the steps of what is involved in a spill management. We will now look at the steps involved in managing a chemotherapy spill. In this event, the nurse has come in and found that chemotherapy has spilled on the floor. We do not need to turn off an IV pump as that is not as how, as not how our chemo is being administered. The first thing that we'll do is put on our PPE. We're putting on a non-permeable chemotherapy gown. 
we're going to put on our non-permeable chemotherapy gloves. There are some in the spill kit. We also have the latex-free sterile gloves that we can use, two pairs. Our face shield or goggles as seen here, and the N95 mask. I encourage staff to use a disposable N95 mask so they can get rid of it when they're done. We're also going to have a second person come and help us clean up the spill. They will put on the same PPE, the non-permeable gown, the double non-permeable gloves, the N95 mask, and the face shield. The next thing we'll do is put down the absorbent pads directly over the spill. There are four or five absorbent pads in each spill kit. These pads are capable of absorbing 250 to 500 mLs of fluid per pad. We move them around on the solution to absorb as much liquid as possible. Once we've picked up as much as possible, we then lift the pads and put them in the chemotherapy waste bag. When we're all done, this bag will then go into our chemotherapy waste bin. This shows the absorbent pads and how much they're capable of absorbing, which like I said, 250 to 500 mLs. The next thing you'll see here is the nurse is using a solution to clean the floor, the area that the chemotherapy was spilled on. We do not make the solution. We use the surface safe wipes that are provided in our chemotherapy spill kit. When we start cleaning, we want to clean from the least contaminated area to the most contaminated area. Again, we start with the first wipe labeled one, which is the high potency bleach. And then we move on to the second wipe number two, which is the inactivating agent. Once we are done cleaning with those wipes, and there are three in each kit, we then use water to rinse the area again, and then we're able to call EPS to come and clean the area. All materials go into the chemotherapy waste bin, and then, and this includes, I apologize, this includes our PPE. We will stop here. Once we're done cleaning, again, all waste will go into the chemotherapy waste bin. Once that gets filled, we're able to call EVS to get a new bin delivered to the unit. One of the final things we're going to go over are safe handling precautions. These are the signs that we use on 4G to indicate safe handling precautions for our patients. It's important to know that chemotherapy safe handling precautions should be maintained from the time of administration through 48 hours post-administration. In this time, patients are able to excrete chemotherapy trace amounts through body fluids. This includes urine, stool, emesis, and sweat. When handling any of these body fluids, staff, patients, their family members should use appropriate precautions. When staff is cleaning this up, we should use appropriate PPE a face shield whenever there's a risk of splashing, double chemotherapy appropriate gloves, so our latex free sterile gloves, or we have gloves available on 4G that are chemo safe. Any container that comes in contact with patient fluids should be emptied appropriately and then disposed of in the chemotherapy waste bin. This would include the Foley bag, syringes, an emesis basin, the plastic can potentially absorb trace amounts of the chemotherapy and therefore should not be disposed of in the regular garbage, but instead should be disposed of in the chemotherapy waste container. Patients and their families should be discharged with education on safe handling. Because of that, we have developed a smart phrase, which is SJMO urology discharge. The pre-procedure instructions include restricting fluid intake, 
consumption of caffeinated beverages and use of diuretics four hours prior to the procedure, if possible, physician provider pending. The precautions post-procedure include, call your, your urologist immediately if you have any adverse reactions. Flush twice after you go to the bathroom. Do not use any public toilets and only use a restroom for the next 48 hours. You should sit on the toilet to avoid splashing urine for the first six hours post-procedure. If discharging home with a urinary catheter bag, follow steps B and C. Wash the groin and genitalia after urinating to decrease irritation from the medication. If sexually active, wear a condom with intercourse for the next 48 hours. For urinary incontinence, immediately wash clothes in the washer. Do not wash with other clothes. If wearing an incontinence pad, pour bleach on the pad, allow to soak in, then place in plastic bag and discard in the trash. Wash groin and genitalia with any incontinence. If experiencing side effects, contact urology clinic or provider if fever is over 101.3 with chills or rigors. Common side effects include low grade fever, urinary frequency and urgency, burning with urination and fatigue. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, my contact information is here. Please let me know and I appreciate your time. Thank you.